A man is never seen as he really is, even through his own eyes. At least that's what my father used to tell me. He himself was loved by many, yet surely despised by an equal number. He wasn't easy. I remember once I accused him of being a true lover of humanity. After a long silence, he said to me, Paul, I don't know if I am or not, but the one thing I have learned and witnessed just about everywhere in my life is man's cruelty to man. Eugene Prendergast, for the murder of the Honorable Carter Harrison, Mayor of Chicago, I hereby sentence you to be hanged by the man of death. Captain Black! Captain Black! Mr. Judge Lyman is ready for us downstairs, sir. Now. Now. I was taught no crime deserves hanging. What do you expect, Clarence? The man assassinated the mayor, an eye for an eye. Well, what I expect is a little mercy from this city. Ah! 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 What's way? I'm fine, ah! Mister. Ah! 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 Trash. Who do they think they are? Lousy strikers. Telling us how to run our business, they have no right. What that they did to my suit. Just send him the bill, Moran. I'm sure the union would be happy to take care of us. Fred Matichek will never be able to walk again, support his family, or play with his children. I know you feel his pain as I do. We all do. When he became a railway switchman, Fred Matichek knew all too well the dangers of his job. Even I know these dangers, and I'm just a lawyer. We all know that lawyers don't know much of anything. <laughs> But unfortunately, what Fred Matichek does not know about is the law of assumed risk that says that if a man takes on a dangerous job, the risk is his. Gentlemen, the railroads have made this city great, and they will make it greater still. But not if they are forced to pay for the mistakes of men. Feel sorry for Mr. Matichek, as I do, but do not halt the forward march of this great land. The jury finds for the defendant. The Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. Oh. Congratulations, Darrow. Old man Hewitt will be pleased. He had come a long way from Ohio, that's for sure. We all had. I swear there must have been more people living in our block on Vincennes Avenue than in the whole town of Ashtabula. Hi, girls. Hey, sure stop. Hi, Papa. How are you? Hey. Hi, Brian. You winning? No. Mm -hmm. Well, don't worry, Paul. You know, there's always another turn at bat. A boy could never be bored in Chicago, he would tell me. And I suppose it was true. Two men on base, two men out. In the last half of the last inning. Concentrate, I said to myself. Concentrate and keep your eye on the ball. The pitcher wound up with a great big motion and hurled the ball as hard as he could, harder than the first two. But this time I saw the ball as clearly as I see you now. So then I swung my club as hard as I could. I even kept my eyes open while I did it. And oh my, what a clout. Over the roof of the general store and all the way down to the riverbank. I ran around all the bases before anyone even got close to it. And when I reached the home base, I was mobbed by what seemed like the entire village. That was a feeling. That was a feeling. Jesse? Jess? Oh, there you are. I so much prefer these affairs to your debates downtown. Well, why is that? Because they make you dress up. And when they make you dress up, you have to wear one of these. Mm. So? 
So, if it weren't for these fussy ties, we'd never spend any time together. <laughs> Come on, Jess. We have to talk. Oh, that's perfect. Clarence, I want to have another child. What's wrong with the one we got? I mean it. It's getting too quiet around here. Well, that kid is anything but quiet. How do you know? Jess, I've got to go. We'll talk about this later. Yes, well, I think the strike this. Yeah. George Pullman is a very good way to handle his career. Yes, well, we need to break this strike. Well, he needs to be neutral. He's been, he's been hard. You're hard. asking me to set a dangerous precedent here. I know, but Matichek worked for our company for a lot of years. <laughs> take the job, take the risk. I know, but still, I feel we owe him some compensation anyway. I don't think our stockholders would approve to you. The hell with them, they can afford it. Well, no. They pay you a tidy sum, don't they? All right, Clarence, do what you think is best. But get him to sign a secrecy oath. This mustn't get around. Thank you, sir. I'm told you're taking time off to work on an appeal for that lunatic who killed the mayor. Tilting at windmills, are you? All right, you can take a week. But then I'll want you back here to help put down this strike before things get out of hand. The strike was growing. What started as a local grievance at the Pullman Car Company now threatened to cripple the whole country's railroad system. Every night, workers held public meetings all over Chicago. And that's where my father first saw Eugene Debs. Well, the American Railway Union wants to join our brothers from Pullman. And we intend, therefore, to strike any train that carries a Pullman car. Well, why should we risk our families for those guys? It's their strike, not ours. Right. They got it easy over there in Pullman. Pullman gives them houses, grocery stores. Hell, they even worship at George Pullman's church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why well, they're living in a Pullman hell. Now, my friends, Master George's uh, workers' paradise is no better than the plantations of old Dixie. It still ain't our fight. Right. Yes, brothers, it is your fight. Today, the struggle is in Pullman. But tomorrow, you can be damn sure it'll be your wages they cut, your jobs they take away, your safety they disregard. Those railroads may have the money, and they may own the machines, but never forget that it is our labor that makes the engine run. And we, when we act not as isolated and helpless individuals, but as one living, breathing, powerful organism, then we can make them all deal with us as men and not property. In this unity, my brothers, in this union lies our strength, our future. It's the very lives of our children. Hang him! Hang him! Hang him! It has been our intention in this hearing, Your Honor, to prove that Mr. Prendergast is without full possession of his mental faculties, therefore unable to understand... You devil! I don't even know you, you foul dung heap. The proof is before us, Your Honor. My client is clearly... On... Mr. Prendergast, sit down. Don't piss in your shoe, Judge! I saw you in there. I saw what you did. Remove this man. Poor master! Fornicator! Get him out of my sight! Your Honor, as you can plainly see, Mr. Prendergast's conditions support... What I can plainly see, this animal is still a menace to this community and an affront to the good Christian values of our fair city. Court is adjourned. Your Honor... to bed. It's late. We lost him. Prendergast? You did all you could. Did I? I wonder. We'll never really know, though, will we? Good night. Clarence, good morning. Did you hear the news? Finally got their hanging. Oh, yes, I saw that. I'm sorry. 
But I, I meant the news about the strike. What news? We've sent in federal troops to break it. You can't be serious. Yeah, I'm serious. The management committee attached U.S. mail cars onto Pullman trains. Then they got the federal government to issue an injunction against the unions for blocking the transport of U.S. property. <laughs> Ingenious, isn't it? Lousy strikers never had a chance. It was a massacre, Clarence. We sent in 4,000 troops. They arrested Eugene Debs. I think it's a good idea that uh, you take a close look at these. Mr. Hewitt wants you with him at the next committee meeting. Good morning. You looking for something, mister? No, I, I just... Yeah? Georgie Pullman sent you here, didn't he? No, no, he didn't. Yeah, he did. He sent you to spy on what's left of us, didn't he? We'll take a look around, mister. We don't have anything to hide here. We've seen what your soldiers can do. And we're still here. You tell Georgie Pullman something for me. You tell him I'd rather die in the mud right here. Serve if slay one more day. You tell him for me. We're gonna beat his ass. You tell him that. You tell him Ida Doherty and Jane Debs are gonna beat his ass. Go on. Marvin, I have appreciated my tenure here, and I've enjoyed working with you as a colleague and a friend, but I simply can no longer work here in good conscience. I have no choice. Steps. That's all you got. Mr. Debs, my name is Clarence Darrow. I've heard of you, Mr. Darrow. You work for the railroads. So don't tell them you've come to make a deal. No, sir, I have no deal. And I no longer work for the railroad. Is that so? I have come to offer my services in your defense. At a sizable cut in salary, I'd say. Sizable, yes. Yeah. I guess you can afford it then. Mr. Debs, I'll be quite frank with you. I can't afford not to take this case. I've watched Chicago stretch and grow beyond all imagining. 
And I watched the railroads grow with it. The city and the rails, they feed each other. And they have enormous appetites. Their bellies don't concern me, Mr. Darrow. I'm only interested in guts and those people out there. It's the ones who work a long and honest day's work, and they still can't put food on the table. They're the ones who concern me. They're the ones who have guts. Not company lawyers, safely sheltered in their big houses. I've just been informed that in addition to the civil charge against you for violating the injunction, you were going to be charged on a far more serious federal charge. And what is that? Criminal conspiracy to obstruct the transport of the United States mails. They're swine. They're swine. However, I did manage to get your bail lowered. Your release, Mr. Debs. You can call me Gene, Counselor. And what shall I call you? Anything but Clarence. Not be intimidated, gentlemen. Authority is nothing more than what the rich and powerful, the George Pullmans of this world, can put over on the rest of us. Once the jury understands this, the case against my clients will wilt. Find out what you can. Who was there? How long they stayed? Anything. May, you get down to the U.S. Attorney's Office, you get your hands on the jury list. We'll need to know the opposition well, gentlemen, how they work and how they think. What are these for? Mr. Gregory wants you to look them over. Kindly return these to my illustrious co-counsel, Billy. Go on now. Mr. Gregory is the best damned attorney in all the Midwest, truly. But I will leave him to argue the points of law. Even so, we will lose on the points of law. And what are we doing here? Coming up with another tack. There was indeed a conspiracy here, gentlemen. But not by the defendants. Mr. Debs and the American Railway Union met in public out in the open for all to see and hear. Whether you agree with them or not, they lawfully supported a lawful strike by workers who decided to lay down their tools rather than slave under the yoke of Mr. George Pullman. <laughs> Your Honor! Your Honor! I demand that these hooligans be removed. I think that would be premature, though I caution the spectators. Continue, Mr. Darrow. Oh, yes, there is a conspiracy here, all right. And there are criminals in this case. They are here in this courtroom, but they're not sitting at that table. No. No. The conspiracy here was hatched and carried out by the members of the General Managers Association. A-C-H, N-I-D. It's arachnid. <laughs> and that's the word they gave me. Boy, and when I got it right, I was spelling champ of the whole damn county. <laughs> and you know what the prize was. Without question, a Bible. <laughs> And do you know what the inscription read? Read and obey. <laughs> uh, I still carry it with me wherever I go. Uh, <laughs> 
Well, yeah. thank God in our house, the good book gathered dust up on the top shelf between <laughs> Aesop's fables and Bullfinch's mythology. <laughs> the only thing in the Bible that ever made sense to me was Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity and a striving after the wind. Just dark thoughts for a child. <laughs> Hell is that at this hour? I got him. Got what? I won't ask where you got these. Mr. Debs, did the employees of Pullman seek redress of their grievances before going out on strike? Yes, several times. But Mr. Pullman refused to meet with them. Can you tell us why the American Railway Union became involved in the affairs of the Pullman workers? We voted to go out on industry-wide strike in sympathy and solidarity with our oppressed brothers. An injury to one is the concern of all. Were any of your meetings held in secret? No, not a one. Thank you, Mr. Debs. Mr. Debs, did you or did you not meet together with your co-defendants and others to counsel a strike. We did. Is this not then by definition of law a conspiracy? Objection. Sustained. I have no further questions. Redirect, Your Honor. Proceed, Mr. Darrell. Mr. Debs, did you, as Mr. Milchrist states it, counsel to strike against the railroad companies? Yes, sir, we did. Did you counsel to strike to obstruct the United States mails? No, sir, we did not. Thank you, Mr. Debs. I have no further questions. The defense now calls Edward Lorber, president of the Ashes in Topeka and Santa Fe Railroad. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. <sighs> Mr. Lorber, you are a member of the management committee of the General Managers Association, are you not? I am, yes. Did you, in any of your committee meetings, suggest that United States mail cars be removed from the trains which normally carry them and be specifically attached to trains carrying Pullman cars? Oh, not that I remember. No. I see. Did you, on any occasion, suggest that this action be taken as a way to bring a federal injunction in order to stop the strike? Well, again, I'm afraid I just don't recall. Well, do you recall, perhaps in another meeting, suggesting that federal troops be brought in to break the strike? Your Honor, this is harassment. Well, perhaps I can refresh Mr. Lorber's memory. Committee meeting, October 14th, Lorber, quote, The injunction isn't enough. We need troops to destroy them. We enter as Defense Exhibit C, the minutes of the meetings of the General Managers Association, October 1894. Your Honor! <laughs> Your Honor, with these minutes, we will show that officers of the railroad corporations conspired in secret to bring government intervention into this strike and to foment the obstruction of the mails and the subsequent violence in order to destroy Mr. Debs and his union. Your Honor, this is absurd. Mr. Darrow is completely out of line. What has any of this to do with the charges brought here? The defense will show that Mr. George Pullman and his cronies at the management committee have conspired to deny the workers of the American Railway Union their constitutional right to withhold their labor in the face of inhuman conditions. I have subpoenaed Mr. Pullman and wish to call him to the stand. Your Honor, it is Eugene Debs, not George Pullman, who is on trial here. Gentlemen, the hour is late. We'll pick up this matter at 10 a.m. I expect the both of you to have regained your composure by then. Yes, it's after two. Are you still up? I couldn't sleep. Where were you? Working. Went over to the White Horse with the boys. Mm. 
My goodness, you're drenched. I walked all the way home. I'm too excited. I think we got him, Jesse. We've got him. Who is we? Are you talking about me? Are you talking about Paul? This is not the life we chose, Clarence. This is the life you chose. You've married Chicago. Gene Debs and his people have become your family. Jesse, for the first time in my life, the very first time, I feel that I'm doing what I was meant to do. I know. Something's wrong. One of the jurors didn't show. They're saying he took sick. Your Honor, I insist that another juror be impaneled immediately. He could be read the trial record. Not could... possible, Mr. Darrow. I'm compelled to declare a mistrial. As a result, the prosecution has elected to drop the pending criminal charges. Your Honor, my client has a right to clear his name. And... Case is dismissed. In the meantime, the defendant is remanded to custody to serve the remainder of his sentence for contempt of the injunction. Your Honor, Court this is, is the most... Damn it. All right, Counselor. We chased him from the battlefield and we lived to fight another day. Yeah, but I wanted Pullman. I really wanted him. All the same, you were splendid. It was well done. that I would rather be a friend of the working man than to be a working man. <laughs> Sorry it worked out. No, you're not. Not really. We both did what we needed to do. I just never imagined growing old without you. They play a pretty tough brand of baseball in Ohio. Yeah. So I'll come watch you play often, I promise. Okay. He never did come out to Ohio, but he wrote to me every week for years. He missed us at first, but he quickly took to being his own man and dedicating himself completely to his work. Dope, he used to call it. Work, sex, religion, they all were dope as far as he was concerned. The legal narcotics human beings use to forget the pain of their existence. And he freely admitted he was as addicted as the next person. His private practice flourished. When he wasn't off somewhere fighting the labor wars, he'd be home in Chicago, taking on the poor and indigents that no one else would. They called him the attorney for the damned. So when they started toward the house, Raymond got his gun. Did he warn them before he started firing, Mrs. Jackson? Yes, sir. He yelled and screamed and, and shot in the air. But it didn't do no good. They just kept it coming until Raymond... Until those two white men fell dead. He worked hard for what he's got. He deserves to live wherever he wants. It's too bad his neighbors didn't think so. 
Don't worry, Mrs. Jackson. I won't let them hang your son. Okay. You take good care of her now. Not a good idea to give her so much hope, Daryl. Well, you don't think so, do you, Edgar? No, I don't. Well, then you'll be mighty disappointed when I win the case. Unlikely. I've got to get over to the American. Such rubbish in that paper. I hate the fact we represent them. Well, we don't represent them, Edgar. I do. But just keep reminding yourself when you're not writing poetry that it's Hearst's money that pays the bills. But while I'm gone, why don't you drop a brief on the Jackson case? What time will you be back? Late. But that's okay, because Sisman will stand help. Won't you, Peter? Yes, sir. Oh, that'd be a big help. The Founding Fathers, whom we celebrate on the 4th of July, came to this country of their own free will. Yet there are others who helped build this country whom we do not celebrate. These were captured like beasts, torn from their homes and families and brought here like so much cargo to suffer generations of hardship, misery, and abuse. Yet they cleared our land tilled our soil, planted and harvested our crop. Some even raised our children. No, we do not celebrate these. We revile them. Suppose you were a Negro. Suppose every day of your life you sat down to supper with your parents and your grandparents, and you saw in their eyes and on their bodies the scars of bondage and hatred visited upon them by white men. And then suppose a mob of white men attacked your home where your wife and children lay in their beds. What would you do? The law has made the Negro equal, but man has not. Gentlemen, you are here to exercise the law and leave aside your prejudice. Thank you, Mr. Darrow. Congratulations, Mr. Darrow. Thank you, Miss. My name is Ruby Hammerstrom. I write for the Evening Post. I wonder if I might ask you a couple of questions. Certainly, I'd be delighted. Wonderful. Perhaps there's a place nearby we can go? Yes, you were in the courtroom. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ruby. Really, really well, cool. I appreciate it. Oh, my. I wasn't expecting this. Well, you want to make a run for it? I hope you don't mind. It's the American. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, Smitty. Are you sure it's all right for me to be in here? What a question from a woman in your profession. Harry, send over a couple of uh, glass of sherry, all right, for you, Miss Hammerstrom. Actually, I'm a shot and beer gal myself. Really? Harry, make that two beers and two shots of your best whiskey. And uh, send over a couple of towels. We're soaked to the skin here. <laughs> I couldn't have been more than four or five. He'd hide the runaway slave in a secret compartment he'd build into his wagon, and then he'd sit me up next to him. We'd go along the next stop on the Underground Railroad. Nobody thought to stop us. I guess you come by your convictions honestly. Your father sounds like a good man. The village infidel, they used to call him. Whatever the town did, he went the other way. He just died last year. I'm sorry. What about you? How do you come to be a journalist instead of some lucky man's wife? Well, I left home when I was 18, and uh, writing was the one thing I knew how to do, so I came to Chicago, started knocking on doors. Just up and left, did you? <laughs> That's right. I never much cared for baking pies and shoveling manure. Well, you're quite of an independent mind, aren't you? I guess you could say so. Well, I'm a writer myself, you know. I just never find time for it. One of these days, though, I'm going to give up the law altogether and, you know, devote full time to it. Really? May I have this dance, Miss Hammerstrom? 
It's all right. We're all old friends here. It's all right. I don't... Come on. I don't know. Here we go. I'm sure this is a good idea. I've heard that you're very courteous to the press, sir. You don't suppose this is what they were talking about, do you? <laughs> Come well, on. Well, I still say it looks better on me, but if you insist. I'm afraid I must. Thank you. <laughs> Well, Mr. Darrow, thank you for the interview and the dance. Not so formal. Drop the mister. Just call me Darrow. You don't like your first name? I think of it as a curse. Oh. <laughs> All right, then. Darrow. How about dinner tomorrow night? No business, just pleasure. Oh. Mr. Darrow. I'm afraid that wouldn't be possible. You see, I'm engaged to be married. You're kidding. Well, you're just going to have to call that off. We've only just met. <laughs> Come now. We both have reputations to uphold. Good night, sir. Miss Hammerstrom. Ruby. You should know that I'm a very persistent fellow. Good night, Mr. Darrow. Good night, Miss Hammerstrom. Myself. Are you sure these are big enough? Edgar, what do you think? All right. Uh, my tickets. What do I do with my tickets? Right here, where you left them. God. Box seats. The opera? Third base, Edgar. Mr. Dotto, this wire came for you. My dear sir, as my heart belongs to another, I must respectfully decline. It's from John Mitchell. United Mine Workers. They finally got the mine owners to go to arbitration after six months on the strike. They want me to represent them. Where? Scranton, Pennsylvania. How long? I haven't said I'd do it yet. How long, Darrow? Uh, probably three months. How much? Enough to get by. Lillian, get your pad. We're going to draft an answer right away. Sisman, sir. Here's two tickets to the ball game. Take the afternoon off. On your way, bring these to Miss Hammerstrom. Tell her that I had an emergency, but I will see her at 5 o'clock. Edgar, help me draft a response, will you? My dear sir, as my heart belongs to another, I must respectfully decline. Edgar! I will write you every day. Don't be silly. You won't have time for that. Every day. I wish you wouldn't. Have you set a date yet? Soon. Soon you're to be married, or soon you intend to set a date? Set a date. Give Miss Ring back. What? It's the only right thing to do. I beg your pardon. Well, don't worry. I'll provide the postage, but you're going to have to write the Dear John. Mr. Darrow, please. Well, all right. I'll write the letter. Honestly, you are relentless. Here we are. Ruby, I'm going to be gone for three months. Come with me. Impossible. Are you sure? I'm sure. Well, then please don't do anything foolish while I'm gone. Luck in Pennsylvania, Mr. Darrow. Dear Ruby, I want to run screaming from this place. Have we really entered the 20th century? When we send decent people into the earth for 12 hours a day, six and seven days a week, at wages that keep them hungry? What do you do down there in the mines? I work in the breaker. I pick the slate out of the coal chute. And how long, how many years have you been working for the coal mines? About five years. What time do you start in the morning? Before sunup. And what time do you get home at night? 
About nine. And how much do you get paid for this job? Forty cents a day. Only I don't get to keep it. Well, why is that? On account of when my daddy died in a cave-in, he still owed back rent. So they just take it out of my money. And how old are you, Henry? Fourteen, sir. Yet the workers' demands are so simple and humane. A living wage, a livable work week, and recognition of a union to protect them. The rights and interests of the laboring man are best looked after, not by agitators, socialists, and unionists, but by the Christian men to whom God, in his infinite wisdom, has given the control of the property interests of this country. These men don't suffer. Hell, half of them don't even speak English. The whole country is taking notice of what we're doing here. I've never seen so many reporters in one place. None of them as pretty and smart as you, of course. I miss you terribly. Call it fate or kismet, but I know that we two must be destined for a life together. Love, Dee. Dear Dee, there is a groundswell of excitement here among working people, even from this distance. I wish I were there. Gentlemen, what are these workers really asking for? A better, fuller life. Time for a breath of life, for a chance to develop the best within themselves. Behind the black hands and black faces of these men who toil in the bowels of the earth are hearts, minds, and intellects as true as in any man who has ever lived. Certainly as true as those who have grown rich and comfortable from their labor. Gentlemen, if you can understand this, then you can seize this historic opportunity to bring harmony and prosperity to this great valley, which should be blessed. But Tanal has been cursed. He did it. Eight hour day, 10% raise, overtime pay, and even paid holidays. Lucky then. <laughs> As children, everything was magic. We breathed an enchanted air and saw nothing as it really was. It's lovely. Come back to bed, Mr. Darrow. We can read it tomorrow. You promise, Mrs. Darrow? I promise.
they were inseparable. And for years they crisscrossed the country on book tours and lectures, and to take on the big, impossible union cases. And the more he won, the more he seemed invincible. on the labors of honest men. But I promise you one thing. Whoever's responsible for this will hang. It's a classic frame-up, I'm telling you. It's Otis, who runs the papers out there. He's so crazy about the unions moving in, he blows up his own plant. And then he pins it on a couple of union organizers out of Indiana, McNamara brothers. And he's looking for a hanging. Figuring on wiping us out. And we're winning. We practically got a socialist elected as mayor out there. We beat this and he'll be a shoe in and Los Angeles will be ours. Boys, I'm exhausted. I promised Ruby we'd stay home for a while. The whole country is watching this one, Daryl. That Otis, he's looking for a hanging. Every union man in this country is chipping in his quarters. Well, you are the one they want. Only one. Blood all over this one, Dee. Every time it just gets a little uglier, a little more violent. You said so yourself. You promised me you'd leave it alone. I'm going to hold you to it. These are our people, Ruby. They're galvanized around this case. The future of this country is in California. And you need to be there. Yes. And you think no one else can do it but you. I bring you the man who went to Pennsylvania and got us the eight-hour day. So the ends justify the means, Mr. Darrell. You've said so yourself. And if it takes violence to loosen the capitalist grip, then violence it is. But we're not about killing working men. Well, how is it that they picked you out, John? Otis has had his eye on us since we started organizing out here last year. He's absolutely rabid about unions. He's a crazy man. The way he rides around with that stupid gun in his car, shooting nails into strikers. He ain't no chill. He just calls himself that. Get over here, you gotta get into the school! Oh, you get away from me! Oh, I ain't taking up to me! You're gonna burn in hell, old shit! Calm down! So that's Ordy McManigal, the one they arrested with you but didn't charge. Ordy used to work in the office with this part time. Word on the floor is he's making a lot of trips upstairs. They're saying he's been telling the DA he was with us when we planted the dynamite. The lying bastard. I used to trust Ordy, Mr. Darrell. I really did. They must have scared him. I paid him off pretty good. This isn't going to be pretty, gentlemen. They want your necks. Prepare for a long struggle. They're good boys, aren't they? There are no good boys here, Gene. You know that. Well, they're good enough to be right. They're good enough to win. That's all that counts. What do you think, Mr. Darrell? Can you get him off? I didn't come all this way for a hanging. Can you tell us about your strategy? To win. Do you think you have the resources to match Mr. Otis? Gentlemen, every member of every union in this country has pledged a quarter for these boys. Think of it. 
Three million men, women, and children have taken food from their tables for this common cause. Mr. Darrell, I trust you'll be able to adjust to Los Angeles. Unlike Chicago, this is a real law and order town. Well, whose law and whose order are we talking about, General? I'm aware of your reputation, Mr. Darrow, and I caution you. Anyone who espouses criminal causes as you do is a criminal in my book and will be treated accordingly. Well, I've been threatened before, General. From you, it's particularly flattering. <laughs> Prepare for war, Mr. Darrow. Can we vote you on that, sir? Is that for the record? Excuse me, General, if I could just get you to read that quote, please, sir. Mr. Darrow, what General? Mr. Darrow, what General? General. 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 I've never been to Los Angeles. I'm gonna need that kind of investigative work for my team, Mr. Franklin. No, 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 wait. Call me Bert. Bert. Gene, over here. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, Bert. Bert. Well, what about Bert? Well, it's possible, but I'm gonna Who's that? Uh, Bert. Uh, the detective that McCombs in Chicago referred to us. Yeah. I think he'll do. Look, Gene, I need to start seeing some money. Oh, easy, Counselor. We're bringing in as much money as we possibly can. I mean, Willie Hurst, you know. Well, Otis is out there with his deep pockets, you know. I mean, we've got to match him stride for stride. I'll get it for you. You just take care of our boys before the election. You bring it home, Dara. We're all counting on you. And get a hold of the jury list. Investigate every man on it. Go to their homes dressed up as a Bible salesman or, or, or tell them that your automobile broke down, but get inside their homes. Look around. See what kind of money they've got. See what kind of books they've got on their shelves. You can tell a lot about a man by what he reads. I want to know who's friend and who's foe. It's going to cost, Mr. Dow. Whatever it takes, Bird. You want to go back to Mr. Fredericks and talk about the deal I made with him? It was James who was with you, right? The two Jim. of you. So Jim. what? Jimmy, Jimmy, right. Matt, right? Where was John? I'm not going to tell you anything about John. Where'd you get the dynamite? Catch Where'd you get the I dynamite? I got the dynamite. You got Isn't the that dynamite, enough? right? And the two of you blew up the Times building that night. It gets worse. They found a fellow who says he sold Jimmy McNamara dynamite on four separate occasions in the past year. The last time was three days before the Times explosion. Reasonable doubt, Bert. Just give me a reasonable doubt. Rogers, don't you? And this is Ordy McManigal, a colleague of your client. I know who he is. Tell Mr. Darrow what you told us, Ordy. Come on, Ordy. I work for Jimmy McNamara. I done his dynamite, 200 bucks a pop. We done the times together. What is this, Fredericks? I bet you got more than 200 bucks for this little story, didn't you, Ordy? No, sir, this ain't no lie. Federal lie. agents uh, removed these from John McNamara's safe at the Union office in Indiana. Federal agents. Damn it, John, in your own handwriting! The whole plan just written out. Invoices for explosives, names, places, dates. Forgeries. Oh, come on, man. It was all found in your own safe. 
Signed, sealed, and virtually delivered by you. As sure as I'm standing here, they've got all they need to hang you both. That's why we hired you, right? Well, I'm an attorney, not Houdini. Johnny wasn't there. It was me and Norty done it. But we didn't mean for nobody to get hurt. You think a jury gives a damn if he didn't mean to? Jesus, James! Now I'm willing to swing. But it ain't right for Johnny, too. It won't matter. They'll take you both. You're the lawyer, Mr. Darrell. You do what you have to do. You were right, Rube. What's happened? Just gets tighter and tighter like a noose around our necks. D. The damn fools did it. There's blood on their hands, and nothing I say will wash it away. Oh, my God. They killed all those people. Have you talked to Debs? Who else knows? Oh, I know what Debs would want. I know what they all would want. Go ahead, go through with it. So what if they hang? We'll just get ourselves two more martyrs for the cause. Before we met, I watched a client of mine, a crazy man named Prendergast, go to the gallows. Well, never again. Never again. They'll crucify his D. Fifteen years for John McNamara, life for James. Gentlemen, here's what I'm willing to consider. Ten to twenty years for James and set John free. <laughs> this isn't a negotiation. Take it or leave it. Darrell here. If you want to keep Bert Franklin out of jail, you better get down to 3rd and Los Angeles Street. Who's this? Now. I'll be right back, Sally. Yes, sir. How you doing? Can you tell me where the Send you off in good style. Here we go. Hey! What is this? Yeah, your restaurant tank is dry. What? I'm sorry. There's some misunderstanding. I can't. That's the deal that I made with him. So you go talk to him and you let me know as soon as you can. Good Lord, Dee, didn't Franklin know for the new arrangement? No one knew. It was Frederick's idea to keep the plea bargain a secret. But bribing a juror at high noon, no less. I can't worry about it right now, Ruby. It's so stupid. How could he be so stupid? Look, if anyone's stupid, it's me, damn it. I'm the one who gave him free reign. I'm the one who told him to go out and do anything. But you didn't tell him to make payoffs, for God's sake. But I'm the one who walked into this godforsaken town and trusted strength.
Mr. Fredericks, are you prepared to make your opening statement? Your Honor, a recent development in this case compels us to yield to the counsel for the defense. Your Honor, the defense wishes to withdraw its plea of not guilty and enter a plea of guilty. Charges against James B. and John J. McNamara. See this town again, it'll be too soon. Mrs. Darrow, can we see your husband, please? Who is it, Rube? Clarence Darrow? Yes. I have a warrant here for your arrest. Yes, arrest. Put them away. You won't be needing those. Clarence Seward Darrow. You are charged with willfully and feloniously instructing your employee, Bert Franklin, to bribe on your behalf, George N. Lockwood, a juror under consideration for California versus McNamara. How do you plead? Not guilty. Well, we're paid up on the Chicago apartment for two months, but after that... Have you wired Masters for money? Last week. I still haven't heard anything back yet. And Debs? The same. Mr. Darrell? Yes? May I come in? Earl Rogers. Yes. Mrs. Yes. Darrow? Sir, I've come to offer you my services as your attorney. Oh, this will stop at nothing, will he? Does he think we're fools sending you here? Mrs. Darrow, I aided the prosecution because I lost a very dear friend in the Times explosion. Sir, I have followed your career for many years. Of all the men in our profession, you have my highest regard. Well. It's no secret that we're in need of friends here, Mr. Rogers. I'll consider your offer and get back to you. I don't trust that dandy one bit. One of the best around. Didn't you smell the alcohol on him? I don't care if he drinks gasoline so long as he drives us back to Chicago. We will show you that the defendant, Clarence Darrow, came swaggering into Los Angeles with the Chicago ways to offer Chicago-style inducements and Chicago-style bribes and to corrupt the judicial process of our state in its prosecution of the McNamaras. We will show you that this man who has made a good and successful living at the bar flagrantly and maliciously broke the law for his own gain. No man has sullied the honor of his profession or despised the foundation of our judicial system more than this man, Clarence Darrow. After Bert offered me the money, I went to the DA and told him what was afoot. He had me set up the payoff. As Bert handed me the money, a man appeared across the street. Bert said, it's the big man. What's he doing here? What did he mean by the big man? He was referring to his boss, the man who wanted the fix. Is that man in the courtroom today? Yes. That's him.
I'm the one they wanted from the beginning. Not the McNamara's. They wanted me from the start. That's why they sent me that liar Franklin. Don't worry about Franklin. I'll take care of him and Cross. No, no, no. A simple Cross won't do. No, we gotta put Otis up there in that stand and tear him apart. Would you calm down? I know exactly what I'm doing. Oh? Well, maybe I better handle this one myself. I'd hate to think that you were protecting your old boss. My advice to you is that you get a hold of yourself. You look guilty in that courtroom, and you're behaving like a lunatic here. That's quite enough, Mr. Rogers. I will handle Franklin in my own fashion. It's what you pay me for. If you ever get around to paying me. Good evening. of that man. Oh, never mind, D. I'm sure he'll do fine. Did we get a check from Edgar? The hell is this? 200 measly dollars? He hasn't conducted any joint business since we left last year. Six weeks ago, he resigned from the partnership. One by one. Anything from Debs? Mr. Franklin. Yes. After your arrest, uh, didn't you tell the district attorney that uh, Mr. Darrow had no knowledge of your crime? Yes, yeah, first I did, yes. Well, why'd you change your mind, Bert? Because he offered you a deal? No, because I wanted to protect Mr. Darrow, because I felt loyal to him. Because, even though I knew what I was doing was wrong. And District Attorney told you he didn't want you, didn't he? I mean, we want Darrow. Isn't that what he said? Well, he told me to tell him if Darrow was involved, yes. But you said he wasn't involved. At first I did, yes. That was a lie? Well, uh, yes. Hmm. Then you said he was in it. At first I did, yes. And that was a lie, too? No. But how do we know you're not lying now, Bert? Oh, uh, because the fact is, they told you they wanted to get Darrow. And you lied for them, didn't you, Bert? That'll be all, Mr. Franklin. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Is there anything from Debs? No. That just about sums up your whole philosophy, doesn't it? Those who commit crimes such as jury bribery are no worse than those who don't. Objection. What Mr. Darrow wrote prior to this trial is irrelevant and immaterial. Let the prosecution stick to the if facts moral of fiber this case, or lack thereof is what this trial is all about. Have you ever given any money or monies to Bert Franklin for the purpose of jewelry bribery? No. It's been said that the McNamara case is all important to you, to your reputation. How important is your reputation to you? I had to save their lives. I had to. <laughs> no more, Your Honor. While you may think it cruel that your former friends are lacking in sympathy, it has come to light that there may be other examples of misconduct back in Chicago. What on earth is he talking about? Be strong enough to stand alone and face the world unafraid. Always Debs. There's no money. Be strong enough to stand alone. Howard. Well, I guess that's all of them, then. D. They'll send you away. Don't you see that? I'm guilty, Ruth. Stop. I'm guilty as hell. 
guilty the second I talked you into coming here. Guilty the moment I stepped off that train and saw all those cheering faces. I betrayed them, I betrayed you. The only person you betrayed is yourself, D, here and now. I somehow thought I was apart from it, that I was above it. That I was somehow destined to prevail no matter what. But I'm no less cruel. I'm no less guilty. Send yourself to jail, D. But I can't let you do it anymore. Mr. Rogers, is the defense prepared to make its closing argument? We are, Your Honor. Gentlemen of the jury, what am I on trial for? Is it because I sought to bribe a man named Lockwood? If you 12 men believe that after all my 35 years experience, I would offer a $4,000 bribe to a juror while negotiating to avoid a jury trial, then by all means lock me up. For surely I would belong in some state institution. Let us for once begin to tell the truth here. I'm not on trial for the charges brought against me. No. I've committed one crime and one crime only. I have opposed the powers that be. My crime, gentlemen, is that I've spent my life fighting for the weak and the poor and the oppressed. For the men and women who must toil for their bread. And for that, there are those who would destroy me. There are people who would lift up their hands and crash me down. These interests, the rich and powerful, would still my voice. And so here I am today, in the hands of you 12 men. It may be the last chance that I shall ever get to speak to a jury. Gentlemen, if I am guilty, and I have told you in every way, both under oath and not under oath, that I am not. If I am guilty, is there one man in this jury box, one man here who loves justice and fair play, who will say that I should be singled out from among this mess, and every crook and thief and spy and traitor and informer in this case get immunity? No man is judged rightly by his fellow men. Some look upon him as an idol and forget that his feet are clay, as are the feet of every man. Some look upon him as a devil and can see no good in him at all. Neither is true. My character? No, my very soul has been rent asunder in this trial. It doesn't really matter what you decide here, for I am pretty near done. My life has not been perfect. I've done the best I could. Like all men, I've done both good and evil. I can only hope that when the last reckoning is made, the good will overshadow the evil. And if it does, then I have done well.
Mr. Foreman, has the jury reached a decision? We have, Your Honor. Then please rise and read the verdict. In the matter of the People versus Clarence Darrow, we find the defendant not guilty. Congratulations, sir. A tremendous victory. Thank you. Good luck, Mr. Thanks. Darrow. Congratulations, sir. A tremendous victory? I can't imagine he ever thought of it that way. I think two years in hell may have been more accurate. They never again set foot in California. By the time they got back to Chicago, he was broke with no prospects. He tried to pick up where he left off, but in truth, the boys downtown didn't care to know him. And his old labor friends would never again seek him out. At first, he made his living speaking and writing, like he'd always talked about. But the law was still in his blood. So, at a time when most of his cronies were retiring, my father had to start over. Hey, is everyone asleep? Everyone except Mary. She won't stop talking about her poppy. So I guess things are starting to pick up. <clears throat> the body's still warm. People still have a perverse need to pay someone to hear things they don't want to hear. It's good to see you, Paul. It's been too long. I wish you'd let us come out to California. I know. Your letter's meant a great deal to Ruby and me, but I just wasn't up to having company. Listen, Dad, Lillian and I have been talking, and we'd like to invite you out to Colorado, you and Ruby. Paul, this is no time for me to take up skiing. <laughs> I mean to live. You have the family around, and we're getting along well enough to help and you. What with... would I do out there? Go into real estate? No. Paul, thanks for the thought, but I'll rest when they bury me. I've still got things to do in this life. And one of them is finish this puzzle. I guess I underestimated him. I don't know if I could have stayed in the game the way he did. He once explained it to me this way. A pessimist, a true pessimist like myself, he said, knows that life is futile and that his fellow men are cruel, so he expects very little and is seldom disappointed. That's right. Have you any idea what time it is? Yes, I do. I'm sorry to disturb you, but I must see your husband. Well, he's in bed asleep. You can see him tomorrow morning. Mrs. Darrow, I cannot wait until tomorrow. My name is Jacob Loeb. Rich have rights. Well, boys, you've got the whole city and half of America calling for your heads. Well, we want to do something that people would remember forever. The perfect crime. It was supposed to be perfect. Hey, it was your glasses they found in the culvert. 
Yeah, well, if you hadn't kept hanging around the investigation like some hotshot reporter... Boys, please. Mr. Darrow is taking his valuable time. Isn't that what we pay him for, Uncle Jacob? Well, I haven't at all consented to take this case, Richard. Well, I hope you do, Mr. Darrow. You boys say that you had this murder planned for a long time, is that right? Well, yes and, and no. It was going to be like surgery. Better than Jack the Ripper. It was supposed to be a girl. It was his idea for it to be a... a boy. How'd you come to pick Bobby Franks? He was my cousin. It was easy to get him in the car. Babe hit the gas. Babe? Babe is my nickname. Babe hit the gas and I bashed him with the chisel. Maybe I was driving and babe... I forget. So he was already dead when you called his parents for the ransom. That's right. So kidnapping was part of the plan all along. Kidnapping and then murder. Uh, not necessarily in that order. Richard. Well, boys, between the evidence and your confessions, I'd say the state's attorney's got two good chances to hang you. Once for murder, and if that doesn't work, he'll go after you for the kidnapping. And I'd say he's got two damn good cases. look fine. Are you holding up? My brain must be the size of a pea. You sent us so many head shrinkers. I don't know. I kind of found it fascinating. Yeah, sure. It was fun telling each one a different story, whatever came into my head. So when do we make our grand entrance? Well, Nathan, I wanted to talk to you boys before we go in. I know we've spent weeks acting like it, but we're not going to plead insanity. There is no way in the world that we will be able to convince a jury of 12 people that two very bright, very well-educated, and very privileged young boys couldn't tell right from wrong. So we're going to plead guilty to all the charges all at once and stand before one man, the judge, and convince him to save your lives. You have one judge in the rest of the world. Well, that's a um, hell of a time to tell us. I apologize for springing this on you, but surprise was crucial. We couldn't let the prosecutor get a chance at separating the murder and kidnapping charges and get two tries at hanging you. I couldn't tell you before this for fear that someone else might hear about it. I'm sorry to have to do it this way. So you're it, huh? Well, I hope this guy likes the way you play with your suspenders. Or work meat on a hook. Do I have your permission? Therefore, Your Honor, we bring our case before you and you alone and put their fate in none but your hands. We will offer our testimony and evidence not to determine their innocence, but for mitigation of punishment. Your Honor, in the name of the fathers, mothers, and children of the state of Illinois, we will present our evidence and demand the maximum punishment that the law allows for these cruel and vicious murderers. The death penalty. Mrs. Franks, these clothes were discovered in the car rented by Richard Loeb and Nathan Leopold. Are they familiar to you? Bobby's. They were Bobby's. Beside the massive head wounds, hydrochloric acid was poured on the boy's face stomach and genitals. His rectum was also dilated. 
Indicating what, Dr. Springer? Rectal penetration. Oh, Your witness. Dr. Springer, does this last finding necessarily indicate sexual molestation? No, sir. Was there any evidence of sexual molestation? No, sir. Thank you, doctor. I miss having you in courtroom. I know. Those boys make my skin crawl. I'm sorry. How much longer will you be at this? Until I can figure out what all these psychiatrists are talking about, which could take years. <laughs> Don't wait up. All right. Oh, I wish the police would chase them away. Not me. They give me inspiration. Dickie's parents were cold. He constantly strove for attention he could not get. So he escaped into dime detective novels. Over time, he evolved a fantasy of committing the perfect crime. What did you find in your analysis of Nathan Leopold, Dr. White? Babe is an extremely gifted young man. But two crucial events occurred when he was nine years old. His mother, to whom he was especially close, died. And then his father gave him over to the care of a nanny who had him play games with her of a sexual nature. She made him a kind of slave. In Nathan's fantasy world, Richard is the Dream King. They made a pact where Nathan would participate in any crimes Richard wanted him to, as long as Nathan could insert his penis between Richard's legs. Nathan has great disdain for everybody but Richard. I think his love is so great, he'd rationalize anything to keep that affection even murder he was a good boy and a promising boy and would have made a bright and good man instead Bobby Franks was beaten and murdered It's an insult for these two to come before you and ask for mercy, mercy. For cold-blooded, depraved killer. I don't care about their mitigating circumstances, their nannies and their fantasies. I care about my own life and the life of this society. Yes, let's be merciful to ourselves. Let us send a clear and certain message to any others who might be tempted to vent their evil upon us and upon our children. Hang them, Your Honor. Be as merciful to them as they were to Bobby Frank. But I'd join you today if you don't mind. It's pretty rough out there today, Rube. I don't know. So I'm coming, Dee. Your Honor, I have stood here for three months as one might stand at the ocean trying to sweep back the tide. I have heard in the last few weeks nothing but a cry for blood. I never saw such enthusiasm for the death penalty as I've seen here. It's been discussed as a holiday, like a day at the races. I've heard words from the state's attorney that would shame a savage. 
Mr. Crow suggests that if we hang these boys, there will be less killing. This world has been one long slaughterhouse from its beginning until today, and I have no doubt the killing will go on forever. Would hanging them make mankind better or worse? Would it make the human heart softer, or would it make it harder? If the state in which I live is not kinder, more humane, more intelligent than the mad act of these two boys, I am sorry I have lived so long. Why did they kill? Why did they kill Bobby Franks? Not for money. Not for spite, not for hate. They killed him as they might kill a spider or a fly. For the experience. They killed him because they were made that way. They killed him because somewhere in the infinite processes that go into the making of the boy or the man, something slipped. Your Honor, I know that every atom in all the universe is bound together. I know that every influence, conscious and unconscious, acts and reacts on every living organism and that no one can fix the blame. I do not know what made these boys do what they did, but I do know there is a reason for it. Why did they kill? We might also ask, why am I here defending them? Perhaps it's because of all the lives I have touched and have touched me that have formed my fate and brought me here to my destiny. All of these factors out of my control. You can't fight it, I know. Neither can Richard and Nathan. I'm sorry for Bobby Franks, and I'm sorry for his family. Mr. Crow suggests he would have been a man of promise. I do not know. Sometimes a boy of great promise is cut off in his youth. Sometimes he dies and is placed in a culvert. Sometimes a boy of great promise stands on a scaffold and is hanged by the neck until dead. Your Honor, I'm not asking for mercy here. What mercy is it to lock up two boys for life? Where is the human heart that will not be satisfied with that? If to hang these two boys would bring Bobby Franks back to life, I would say let them hang. If the welfare of this community would be benefited by the taking of their lives, well and good. But I wonder if it would do good. I wonder if it would help our children. Your honor stands between the past and the future. You may hang these boys. You may hang them by the neck until they are dead. Today, it will be the easy and popular thing to do. The cruel and thoughtless will applaud. But others, the humane, the kind and hopeful, the mothers and fathers who are gaining an understanding and asking questions not only about these poor boys but about their own, they will join in no acclaim at the death of my clients. They would ask that the shedding of blood be stopped. I'm not pleading so much for these boys as I am for the infinite number of others to follow. It is of them I am thinking, and for them I am begging of this court not to turn backward toward the barbarous and cruel past. I plead for the future. I plead for a time when hatred and cruelty will not control the hearts of men. When with imagination and understanding, 
and faith. We can look inside our own hearts and learn that all life is worth saving and that mercy is the highest attribute of man. I was reading last night of the aspiration of the old Persian poet Omar Khayyam. It appealed to me as the highest that I can vision. I wish it was in my heart. I wish it was in all hearts. So I be written in the book of love. I do not care about that book above. Erase my name or write it as you will. So I be written in the book of love. Richard Loeb and Nathan Leopold were sentenced to life in prison. The next summer, Father and Ruby went to Dayton, Tennessee for the Scopes Monkey Trial, the performance most everybody remembers him for. He took his agnosticism into the heart of the Bible Belt and made the case for teaching evolution in the schools. They didn't much care for him down there. One night, not long before he died, we got into a debate about God and the afterlife, and to settle it, he made this funny bet. He said that if there were life after death, he would come down to this very place on the anniversary of his death and apologize for his lack of faith. It's been 10 years now and still no sign of him. Not that I would ever expect him to show. Even if he could, he'd never admit he was wrong. <laughs> 